Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Scott Sugden, Product and Technology Outreach Manager at L Acoustics. We've actually got a really great conversation today all about the evolution of the system calibration process. And to talk about that, I have brought on three guests from around the world. Uh, I brought Toby Hoff all the way from Cologne, Germany. Is that right, Toby? Yeah, that's correct. Excellent. Hello, everybody. We've got Steel Beatty coming to us from an uh, undisclosed location somewhere in middle America. Is that correct, Steel? That's correct. And Phil Reynolds from sunny, slightly warm Phoenix, Arizona. Hello, everybody. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the their evolution of system calibration. Before we do that, uh, Steel, you want to introduce yourself and just tell everyone uh, who you are, what you do, your favorite thing for breakfast. Um, what kind of car you drive, and uh, are you, uh, you know, a baseball cap kind of guy, or do you like, you know, uh, more of a, a, a professional hat, if you will? Uh, sure. Uh, my name's Steele. Um, I actually work for a AV integrator, Skylark AV. I'm actually on site now. Um, I had to steal a conference room. Um, we're in the middle of, believe it or not, an A15 install out here. Oh, fantastic. Uh, in Houston. Yeah, um, my car is actually an old Jeep Cherokee, which is by by design. Um, I enjoy it. So which model of Jeep so, Cherokee is it? Because uh, this is critical to anyone who is a, a Jeep person. It, it's just it's a 99 Jeep Cherokee with the, the proper lift and all the stuff. Yeah. Oh, good. All right. Good. Good. Excellent. And is it properly dented, scratched, uh, rusted and uh, and the kind of Jeep that you can you can accidentally hit a tree and not be too concerned about? Uh, of course. <laughs> okay, okay, good, got it, perfect. Yes, it is. Good, well, well Steele, you, you work for uh, in AV Integrator, um, so your background on system calibration is maybe a bit different than a lot of people's who are more day-to-day yes. -day show to show, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I don't have a lot of, uh, like these guys, show experience. Um, I I have a lot of long timelines. I can I can be with the system for a long time in design and through calibration. And uh, I have a lot of opportunities to make things perfect versus get it out the door, get it right. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, because the, yeah. the touring scenario, you've got uh, uh, minutes, sometimes uh, less. Yeah. Um, and, yes. and you get months of a project timeline to design, to validate, to rethink, to rethink, to rethink, to rethink, and um, and and go that back around. And... Excellent. Um, That's true. Still, uh, I'm going to jump real quick over to uh, my friend Toby in Germany. Toby, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, long time fan, uh, first time listener, I guess. Uh, Toby, you uh, you mix front of house for a number of different bands. Um, most famously, uh, you've been front house engineer for Deep Purple for a long time. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, I mean, um, uh, once again, um, hello from Germany and thank you, Scott, for the invitation to this uh, webinar today. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been uh, system tech for a long time, actually for Deep Purple for like 10 years whenever they were in Europe. And then I think like eight years ago, I got the phone call, hey, um, like the guy who was mixing before is telling me, hey, I'm getting a real job, like an office job, and uh, do you want to be mixing to purple? And that's how my, it ended up, yeah. Uh, obviously, no shows at the moment, so I am here in my house, in my shop, in my office, which is good. I mean, I can do a lot of things here. Um, yeah, like, like I went cycling this morning, so that's actually a good thing. So, Toby, you've got a few bikes um, and some uh, maybe, shall we say, historic audio gear. How many bikes do you have in the shop there? I have like uh, five or six bikes here. Oh, good, good. Uh, uh, yeah. any, any brand or preference? Are you? Uh, is there one one specific bike that's your favorite, or is it is it all bikes? No, I'm I'm definitely more into mountain biking. I have a road bike as well, uh, but I'm definitely more into mountain biking. I, I enjoy going uphill and downhill. So um, I'm not I'm not uh, too crazy about doing crazy things downhill. Um, I mean, I've had to go to the hospital a few times to get some <laughs> stitches and stuff. Uh, just want to be healthy, right? I actually have a road case for a bike. So when, normally when I'm on tour, I try to carry a bike with me. Um, it's just sitting here and it's getting dusty at the moment. Well, hopefully soon, Toby, we get to see you again around the world. Yeah, hopefully. And hear you mixing. Let's, let's be uh, optimistic. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, Phil, thank you for joining us. Um, it's great to see you again. Uh, Phil, I get to see you more often than Toby and Steele. Uh, you're coming to us from uh, slightly warm Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, you have the largest truck I've ever seen in my life. Um, and uh, one kid, no pool, three dogs. Is that right? Uh, one kid, no pool, and not the biggest truck that when we met. Oh, got it. Actually a downsize. You've, okay, got it. So oh. you've got a slightly smaller truck, but you do live in Phoenix, so I'd expect yeah. occasionally you go out to the desert and blow stuff up. Is that right? That, that we don't blow up stuff right now because it's on fire. Uh, oh, but uh, yes, camping and getting into the woods and stuff away from the heat is the goal sometimes. Good. Excellent. So. Well, thank you guys for joining us. Um, so I want to actually, uh, I'm going to go to Toby because this is probably the most historic timeline possible. Um, Toby, can you tell us a little bit about your evolution into system calibration? What was the first system you calibrated? Do you remember the first time you actually calibrated a system or maybe the first thing you used or the first piece of gear you used? Well, um, it was it was in the last century. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was actually an in, I was not calibrating myself, but I was an intern uh, at a local audio rental company and we were using a clock DN60, you know, the 2U rack unit with all the red LEDs and the guy uh, was running pink noise through the system and then we would watch the, 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 the frequency response on the RTA and I was, yeah, I was 15, 16 at that time. And um, I mean, I was amazed, but um, obviously back at that time, I mean, what, what, what we did is we, we used the analog crossover and the graphic EQ, you know, to get like a flat response. Um, obviously, now I'm aware of all the limitations that that measuring technique has, you know, the RTE, uh, RTA only seeing um, the, the spectrum at that moment, not knowing where the energy comes from and, right. and not, not knowing the source signal, you know, but that was, yeah, early 90s, I would say. You know, you know, it's funny. You you talk about that style of of not knowing things, and and I can remember myself. You know, calibrating the first PAs was as simple as pink noise and going. The low had about the same energy as the mid had about the same energy as the high, uh, um, and and I remember the first time someone taught me how to time align. You know, which was simply flip the subs out of polarity and make them cancel with the main. You know, and then flip it back. No idea yeah. if you were in the right right wave you know of phase you know you have no idea about that it just it was better than doing nothing and that's kind of what that reminds me of toby is like is it the right way to do it no is it the best way to do it no is it a way to do it and is it better than nothing yes i mean that's like the first start of it um still you've you've been doing this a little less long than toby um, i'm not going to say that toby's an old man um that would be rude to okay. do that um but steel uh, what was the can you think of the first system you ever got to calibrate or, or tune yeah, well, the first one where I was by myself, um, thinking back now, was more complicated than I probably should have taken on. <laughs> it was a, it was a historic building, a historic Methodist church, and it was a place where no speakers could be seen. So we had hidden a small format line array in the organ chamber, and just the nature of the room, there were various delays and other speakers hidden in other cavities throughout the room. And I had the challenge of making that a cohesive system with looking, one microphone. Looking back on it now, um, are you like terrified of those results? Like if you had to go back and see what you did or, or do you think like it actually turned out pretty moderately okay? I am terrified. <laughs> I would like to go back. <laughs> <laughs> Is it still in use? It's still in use, yeah. oh. but it's uh, so all of the instruments, the organ, it's all acoustic and non amplified. So the PA is for speech and vocal reinforcement. You know, it sounds like it's probably one of those fairly live rooms. And so like um, if everything isn't perfectly time aligned, it probably just kind of almost presents more as the room is just liver. Um, which is yes, <laughs> it, it's probably not so bad. You know, it reminds me of like you know, Toby, uh, I know all of us can relate to this. You're mixing a show sometimes and you kind of zone off for like 20 minutes and like just wonder where the world went. You know, you're you're, you're in muscle memory mode and, and you, you come back to consciousness and you look around and nobody's complaining. 
and kind of realize I, I guess I did okay. Um, as nothing like started on fire. So it kind of feels like that to me, like that calibration. Like yeah. I, now I look at this now and I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I do? Well, it's been there for five, 10 years. No one's complaining. Okay, I guess uh, it's not terrible. Um, what steel back then? Uh, um, dun, dun, dun. All right, I think we're back. Sorry, steel. Um, let's see, where was I? So measurement software, what were you using back? Was it a digital measurement platform or a handheld type device? It was, yeah, it was the days of uh, smart. I believe it was version five at the time. Okay. And one, one lonely microphone. One lonely, do you remember the mic you used back then? I, I believe it was the, just the, the DBX RTA microphone. Oh yeah, well you know I, I you know, or not the ninety nine dollar hey uh, um, relatively flat <laughs> relatively flat you know I'm Phil um, I, I know you've been through this process for a long time and you've you've got a fairly uh, I won't say complex robust package of front of house equipment uh, it is it is complex there there's no other words for it it's complex but it it works for you it takes all the the unknowns and put super nerd to it and goes, hey, I'm going to push a button and it'll automate a couple things for you. So sure, it'll even sure. make you a coffee. It'll so. even make you a coffee. That's important. But Phil, that's where you, you are. You actually hit a GPO and trigger. <laughs> so Phil, your background, obviously, um, uh, you've done some shows big and small. You've calibrated big and small systems. Um, you're also a bit of a networked audio guru. Um, I, I don't think we kind of got into that. You want to tell everyone a little bit about that? Uh, on the networking side of things? Yeah, why not? Yeah, why not? Go for it. Uh, well, it all started, you know. Well, actually, first off, the first system I tuned was with Smart 5. Okay. Soon into Smart 6 on Warp Tour. And it ties both of your scenarios and Steel's and I's together. If the first one you've tuned and going, oh my gosh, but it was Warp Tour, uh, flipping the polarity on the subs and, and nulling it out. Then it was my goal on Warp Tour to figure out how to use Smart. So that's so, how I, I think initially got into it. Warp Tour, uh, Toby, I don't know if you're familiar with this tour in Germany. Warp Tour is a pretty famous historic um, pop, not pop, punk rock kind of punk tour. Um, and it went on for what, 25 years, almost 30 years. And it's like 80 bands, five stages, 90 shows in 92 days, something like that. Okay, um, yeah. wow. And by the way, load-in starts at 7 a.m. and the bands are on at noon. So you literally just Sweet. run and go. Now, go. <laughs> let's say um, I would imagine, Phil, that the value is placed on speed versus quality in that situation. And I don't mean that as a negative to quality, but just that you have very little time to go, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very, very dump truck, put it up in the air, look, patch first band, hopefully get breakfast, uh, and then first band hits maybe get lunch um uh, on time but yeah uh, in between bands when we were sitting dark i would actually start playing with the crossovers and the subs and stuff like that right. um but it was just that i think warp tour was the best way to to, to teach you a how to troubleshoot things mix bands and try something new um and that's where you know the evolution of my drive system kind of came into be it's kind of the lead in here uh, started with you know a Mac Mini and a preamp, and now I'm up to 12 drive racks with uh, a very massive Cisco uh, impacted or uh, installed switches and all these racks, and you know hyper nerded out system. So yeah, and and for <laughs> for those of you who don't know Phil, Phil is uh, let's call it a, a audio consultant of grand proportions. You do a lot of high-end corporate where there's 20, 30, 40 arrays of, of audio in a space. Um, you do broadcast audio communications for big major television events, right? Um, uh, yep. You know, so something in the neighborhood of what, 4,000 channels of audio over network? Um, uh, uh, yeah, the X Games is 22 by 15. Yep, so 2200, 100. yeah, there you go. Yeah, make sure you clarify that. Um, 100. And then, um, and then, last and not least, uh, you're the systems engineer for Coachella and Stagecoach Main Stage, which is Stagecoach. What did we count? We figured it out. Was it 37 delay towers? 
this year, if it would have happened, I think it would have up to 36, but our average is 34. 34, got it. Um, 34. And Coachella's, uh, I believe, 15 hangs? Yeah, I think it's only 15 at Coachella. Ironically, uh, the bigger festival has less hangs. Um, uh, but the audience is a bit different as well. Um, so you, that was Smart 5. I think the first version of Smart iBot was also Smart 5. I can't think of what year that was. Before that, I used, there was a Mac software because back then um, Smart wasn't cross-platform was, was it SpectraFood? Does anybody remember that one? Um, that turns out it actually wasn't that good, but it was your kind of only choice um, uh, in the early 2000s. Um, so yeah, so obviously, uh, Phil, that's really kind of cool because the fun thing about system calibration, especially in the beginning, when you get a lot of iteration on the same system, is you start to learn what's good and bad. And I think, Toby, you probably agree with that. That's the advantage of touring is, boy, it's the same system, the same band. You know, you just have to, you're changing one variable every day and you get to try things. Um, you know, uh, uh, Phil, I don't know if you want to kind of go into like, from the start of that tour by the end, did you did you make progress through your, your, your process? Oh, on the, the, the first tour of being the real audio guy of yeah. our tour? Um, yeah, it was actually pretty interesting evolution of how or what I learned about just speakers in general and the interaction thereof. Because um, we don't know about comb filtering at that time. Like, yeah, you're an audio guy, but you're you're trying to stay alive in the 15 in a row tour that you're on. Um, and, uh, you know, the best part about it was guys were coming over and going, hey, what are you doing to your subs? What are you doing to your... I think it was actually Kudo at that time. What are you doing? How are you, you know, making it sound so tight on the sub ends? And I was just like, I'm just playing and, and trying to learn. And uh, we actually had one gentleman that we were kind of nerding out together with each other. Um, just, hey, what would we do? What would happen if we do this? And by the end of it, I was actually really happy with the the system on Warp Tour. It was fun to mix on. It was uh, punchy where you wanted it. and musical where he needed it um later to come on to you know tuning something like coachella that's a totally different animal but it's the same approach yeah make it musical make it uh, a, a nice canvas so it's it's been an evolution of many years with that yeah steel um from the touring side obviously we get that iteration is there a similar iteration process you get on an installation um or, or is it maybe like a very different type of iteration that allows you to grow your skill set in a in a in a way? It's just repetition. It's over time and and learning. You know, you learn little little nuances each and every time. I'm still learning. You know, things come up. Um, I'm, you know, I I, I watch people. Um, sometimes your own Josh Mikeley comes out, and I'll hover over him. Um, I watched your uh, Hollywood Bowl uh, review, and you know I'm just always learning and always always bringing new information in. Right, right. Um, yeah. So like that that evolution that happens over time um, that you go through, um, and I get that like how you can 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 see something and go, oh, that's interesting. Let me think about how I'm doing this. Let me think about how I'm growing. Um, you know, it, it, in in the beginning days, you, you talked about that church that was a hugely distributed system and very reflective. Um, did you learn something that day? Like, was there a single thing that you went, oh, man, um, or was it just the realization, I don't know a lot of things, you know, at that point? Yeah, that day, that, that was it. I don't know much. <laughs> and uh, I kind of had Toby's attack, you know, let's make this thing as flat as humanly possible, which you know, in hindsight is probably not the greatest idea. Um, it should have been tuned for the circumstance and I should, you know, there's a lot of room acoustics and things that should have been accounted for that at the time I had no idea um, should have been a factor in the tuning itself. Sure. Toby, how do you tune? Oh, go ahead. Toby. No, I was just um, to steal. I mean, but you were saying you were using smart already at that point, right? I mean, the thing I was talking about, I was just using a single channel RTA, you know, I mean, with a smart, at least you have two channel FFT and you can compare what you sent into the system and what is showing up at your microphone, which is already 
so much more ahead compared to just looking at an RTA with, with that only sees like the summation of all energy, uh, not considering time, phase, or where it actually comes from. You know, it could be the AC or the chainsaw running next door that you actually see on your RTA, and then you you want to flatten it. So it's yeah. In the beginning days, Toby, like because of that, like obviously you'd see something on an RTA and you'd hear something, and and they probably didn't correlate because it's taking into account all these things that you're. We are back on air. I apologize, everyone watching us live today on Teams. I think I've got a new network adapter that maybe will stay working this time. Um, and now my brain will be slightly less distracted. Uh, shall we continue? Um, so let's uh, let's pivot topics real quick. Um, obviously, beginning days, uh, you know, man had club, um, otherwise known as RTA. Um, man took club, turned it into a hammer, made a slightly better tool. Um, we now have data, right? So we have measurement tools like Smart, like M1, like SysTune, all of these great things that show us information. Toby, how does that data affect your decision-making process? Well, I think um, process is the important word here. You know, in order to get a good result, you have to follow and look at the whole workflow. You know, you do your design, your system design and sound vision, uh, your simulation and sound vision, uh, your auto functions, uh, auto uh, display, auto filter and things like that. And then um, once you're, you then you have to do a system verification. I mean, you, you apply the system, you install the system in the room according to your design. Um, is it in the right position? Is it the right angles, right interelement angles, right wiring, uh, all drivers working, the, the system verification? And then at the very end, you do your system calibration, yeah, like you do a measurement. And um, for me, this is kind of a validation of my design, you know. Ideally, I should not see a surprise at the end of my uh, design when I do my measurement. If I see a surprise, um, then probably something went wrong down the line before. Um, let's say uh, I want to, uh, I realize during system calibration that I cannot time align my delay loudspeaker, which basically means I have to physically move it in a different position. But that basically means that I did something wrong in my design and sound vision, like I did not see the overlap of main versus delay or main versus uh, side PA. I did not use the, the delay mode in sound vision. I did not um, already um, look at those issues before. You know, if it's basically, I think if after um, your system calibration, you have to make decisions, meaning like you have to change the system, then I think something was, was wrong before. Um, I mean, ideally, there should be no big surprises during system uh, um, calibration. Of course, I mean, you, you have to look at time alignment, like uh, optimizing tops versus subs. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have to look at um, frequency response, like you, you, you're, not, you're not tuning the loudspeaker. I mean, the loudspeaker is already, you're not, you're not tuning inside the loudspeaker anymore. Um, this was maybe the last century, but the, 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 the loudspeaker with the preset on the amp, that's already really, really good. You're more addressing things like the room, you know, room resonances, maybe reflections um, or atmospheric issues, temperature, humidity. Sure. Um, yeah. How, you so, know, I mean, in your question, um, making a decision, um, I think the decisions have to be made at the very beginning, and that is all design and uh, I mean something you do in your office or be before you actually in the venue. And then uh, the, the calibration is more like the the icing on the cake. You know, it's like um, getting the ma maximum out of your of, of your installation. Still, I'm assuming and sometimes you have three minutes. So sorry, sometimes you have three minutes for it, or you have like two days for it. You know, if it's a fixed install. So that sure. obviously. Uh, Sure, and and Steele, I I I hear Toby say all these things like it's all about validating what you've done and and making sure that that what you've done is right. I, I'd have to imagine that's ninety five percent the same in an install where you've had months to think through the design. At this point, you you don't expect major problems, right? That's right. Yeah, Toby's one hundred percent correct. And with with this, you know, three D modeling, I actually that's my favorite part is I have in your case, you know, sound vision open and I capture my traces and I love going to sound vision and seeing the predicted traces and it blows my mind every time how how much the same it is, what I've gotten in real life versus 
what was predicted. Yeah. And 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 obviously then when you're on site, you're capturing data, right? So this data is a measurement at a location. And what is it, you know, what is it doing for your process? Is it just helping you go, okay, this is matching what I thought would happen, right? Um, is it helping you build a picture that's better than your brain because you're sitting at one spot and your brain's getting really used to one spot? What's what's that data doing for your process? Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's that's an interesting question. I collecting the data just just to get an overall picture of what the room is doing essentially, and what anomalies outside of the modeling are happening in space, and then where should I attack the system? What you know, because you don't want to go and just put 20 PEQs and make this perfect little. So just kind of get the best average of the space that I humanly can, and then and then play with those decisions until you get the best outcome. You know, um, I'm going to kick over to Phil real quick because uh, most people who are watching this won't know. Phil and I have known each other a long time. Um, we probably first started working together at Coachella seven years ago or eight years ago. Uh, we actually met at uh, one of my first Foo's, Foo Fighters months on tour with them. That's when we, like you guys came into the, you and Dave Brooks came to the, the venue. Uh, and then at, shortly after that, we met at Coachella. Okay, was that Foo's show? I'm trying to, would that have been at like the Forum or something like that probably, or? Uh... It was the Forum or, yeah, San, San Bernardino or something like that. It was, it was an odd show to see you guys show up at. Got it, <laughs> got it. Um, yeah, uh, 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 I forget about that, but yeah, we, we did a couple of Coachellas together and I find that interesting because obviously, um, you know, we get data there, but um, I hate to say this from a measurement perspective in a calibration seminar. Um, uh, I always used to tell us it's a little different now, um, but the schedule says that uh, on Thursday at 12 o'clock, the sound system is allowed to make noise for the first time. And the first band sound check is scheduled for Thursday at 12 o'clock. Um, so they've allocated zero minutes to tune the largest PA you could possibly imagine with more delay towers than you think you need. And oh, by the way, when you take a measurement outside in the desert with high winds when it's dry, it doesn't tell you a lot anyways, right? Like um, if you tune that PA at noon, um, you would be wrong later in the day, wouldn't you? Wrong, yeah. wrong. Yeah. Uh, it, it, any data collected before 6 p.m. is, is basically thrown out the window. Um, at 6 p.m. So right? uh, at, at 6 p.m. Uh, and before, uh, but yeah, you know, for the longest time we had about 15 minutes to tune that system. Right. Um, I actually remember a very vivid uh, year. I don't remember what year because they all blend together, but uh, I was actually unable to get the snakes out to front of house that Wednesday night before. Um, and we actually got an allocation of 10 minutes to grab some data. Um, and I was actually running electrosonics mic around with the tablet and my drive rig was actually set up on stage uh, by the amps because we couldn't get front of house yet. Uh, but we had 15 minutes to actually grab data. Um, to get started. Like what Toby was saying, yeah, to get started. And that's to just, we get the delta of the first you know, main to delay so we can see if the stage was in the right spot and sound vision was all cohesive and right. then we can actually start you know double checking in sound vision because uh, getting a, a, an impulse response at 1500 feet at your last delay towers impossible sure so so uh, yeah I, I, you know i hear all these things i'm thinking about this through like obviously the data is really important um in some ways but it's it's really just the validation of what your whole concept is right um uh I've never been much of a fan of using system calibration as my design tool, right? So um, I don't show up on site and use a measurement and turn the speaker and use a measurement and turn the speaker. Um, I should already have a really good concept of that. Steel, in, in installs, you're you're often, obviously, um, you're probably in what one of two ways. I have an install where they really care about sound and we get the priority and positions and everything else. And then B, by the way, we wanna put the speakers behind an alcove and nobody should see them, please make them disappear. Um, that's got to be harder for you because you can't predict as well what happens behind that baffle and in that cavity they built, right? You, you're right. You cannot. Yeah, and you just you just do the best you can. Quite honestly, uh, how how do you like? I'm going to do a calibration. I've got a speaker inside of a wall. Um, 
how does that change your thought process? Are you looking to get more data to have a better understanding of what's affected by that or what's this or is it is it is it actually just the same process? For me, I found it's just the same process. I mean, there's not much you can do if it's if it's stuck behind the wall. Like if it, in that case, I, I probably play more tracks or, or test material in that environment and hear the actual speaker um, than I would on a on a normal tuning, let's say, just to hear the effects of the room and, and what might that cavity might be be doing. Sure. Um, but I, but typically, it, it's all about the same. Got it. Got it. So um, those things, uh, you guys started, uh, I think everyone here is, uh, all five of us, four of us started with using Smart. Um, did anyone ever use uh, WinMLS? Uh, my, Toby, did you ever use WinMLS? No? Uh, OK. Uh, <laughs> SysTune, has anybody ever used SysTune? Um, uh, let's see, what else? For about three seconds. <laughs> okay. Uh, Roomy Q Wizard, that's another cool one. I don't know if anybody's played with Roomy Q Wizard. I like that one a lot for a while. Um, M1, anyone has been using that for a little while? Um, Toby, did, did you've had it for a little while longer than most, I think. Um, same with Phil. You guys probably got a little sneak peek at it a little sooner than a few other people. Um, is ultimately what you do now the same with an M1, Phil, or, or has that that way it operates made you think differently? Well, let's, I want to, I have uh, kind of three scenarios and it was from small, medium into large, uh, you know, because we're, we're all geared into smart or your chosen uh, calibration software. And, and when Toby and I, you know, the consultants and all got uh, uh, released the M1 beta, um, actually the first show I tried it on was a, a luck of the draw uh, my buddy was a wanting. I was like, hey, let's try this new measurement software. I just got it. I never really opened it, but we got an extra hour. Let's play with it and see what we can do. Uh, it was a generic corporate setup. Eight hangs in the front, eight hangs in the back, and a couple bits of front fill. And um, read the white paper on an M1 and put it out. Um, and that day was the first slight oh, aha moment that I had with it. Um, we did verify with SMART just a couple things, um, but that kind of unlocked the, the thought process of how to approach M1. Um, after that, we went to a festival here in Phoenix called uh, Innings Festival, and it was the first time after uh, the initial M1 class that we were working on. and. The goal was not to open SMART, not that there's anything wrong with it. It was just to go full head on into M1 and work on your workflow, see how it works with, you know, 10 years of touring and multiple years of festivals behind your belt with SMART. How do we incorporate M1 into our world and uh, and use it? So Innings was kind of my, Innings Fest was kind of my trial by fire um and it had really good results i wasn't super happy on it because i was trying something completely new out of my uh wheelhouse uh it sounded great but it just wasn't the workflow i needed for me um and actually a week later we have another festival in phoenix called mcdowell mountain music festival and by the way these are the cobweb shows for coachella get the mm -hmm. rig all dialed in and <laughs> anything i need to fix in town because it is home base for me um but McDowell Mountain Music Festival's, you know, one of my favorite festivals because it's tiny, it's no stress, just fun. Everybody that comes in is just happy to have a good show and stuff like that. I approached uh, McDowell Mountain Music Festival again. Like, uh, we did innings with M1 solely. And that aha moment, that workflow moment, those things that came out of, you know, the software were amazing. And I just looked at my buddy Joe and I was like, this is insane. How, how do we... How did we not have this on tour for you know the nine years on Foos or Coachella when we have ten minutes to do this? We can capture all the data after, uh, during and, and tune afterwards. Just, what, what was that, that big evolution? You know, I, I, I it's hard for me to understand this aha moment because M1 and its concept of post processing EQ is something I've been doing for <clears throat> pardon me many years, right? Um, uh, obviously, there's the version of M1 everyone knows and loves, and there was maybe several things before that that were conceptually similar. 
Um, so what was it? What is the aha moment? Can you describe that moment that clicked? It's, it's, I don't know. It, it's like that really good date with your wife and you just had a really good meal and, and, and you just kind of clicked. Uh, I don't know if that kind of pertains, but it's that same time when you turn on a system for the first time and you hear the whole thing together. It, it kind of has this, this feel to it that the canvas is, is white and ready for a good painting on. Um, and not saying I didn't get that with smart or anything like that, but it's that unknown gray smear of new software, new techniques, new methodology, methodologies that you just don't have yet. And, you know, the McDowell Mountain Music Festival was that very moment of, oh my gosh, the PA sounds different, but better. Sure. And I couldn't tell you exactly why that sounds that way. And it's not just M1. It, it, it is all the auto tools and sound vision and all those things that come up to it. Um, I mean, we do all that stuff in sound vision, but this little icing on the cake of M1 with the, the software suite is just, it ties everything together. Sure. And, and it's just like that nice cake topping. Steel, did you? That, that, uh, yeah, that, that makes sense to me a bit. I, I'm going to see, Steel, did you, is there a similar like, light bulb moment for you because the workflow of m1 is very different right it's it's um it's not the same as a traditional uh measurement software it, was there a moment for you that something clicked and something happened and your, your your process changed yeah so for me for the longest time i traveled with both i traveled with p1 and i had my trusty smart rig in another case because <laughs> it was hard to it's, uh, you know, when you're so comfortable, when you've done something a certain way for 12 years. So the first the first room I used it on, I did my um, zebra pattern, I guess you guys call it, if you will, my my mic placements, my randomized mic placements in the rooms in the safe zone of the speaker and away from the walls. I think I had 12 positions in this room was about right. Uh, turned it on and did the EQ process and set my target curve, made a few tweaks. And before I knew it, my target curve was perfect. And I was like, that can't be it. So I put my mics back out again in a new randomized pattern, uh, did more sweeps and brought that data in. But since the EQ already existed, when I averaged all of my new mic measurements, it was the exact same result. And in that moment, I was like, I get it this is this is awesome right and so and and to oh go ahead well and to and to philip's point there's something i don't know if it's the way the data is presented to you but i feel like you make better choices and when the pa comes on it does sound better and i don't i can't quite put my finger on why that is toby your system tuning often and also mixing or a little bit of both i would imagine especially the days you don't carry a PA that you're running both roles, aren't you? You probably don't get a system tech uh, if it's just a festival. Um, so for you, is there a change to your process because of the way M1 deals with data versus say the older way, or, or is it just a newer tool that's more efficient or, or is there a big change for you as well? Well, actually, if I show up at a festival, or at a theater and there's already a system installed. I'm not that kind of guy that puts up the microphone measuring mic and just starts measuring. I would always have a listen to the system first, um, you know, because everything might be perfect already. Um, I mean, I, this is just a little um, side note maybe, sure. because sometimes I see guys doing that, you know, you they put up one microphone and then they start with pink noise and they start measuring and I'm like, wow. I mean, if it's especially if it's a fixed install, maybe it's like it's you know the the the, the, the integrator spent like two days tuning this system. Just have a listen first and, and see if you like it, or maybe then you can fix it. Um, to be honest, um, I was so looking forward to have the P1 and M1 in my rack for this festival tour this summer because that would have been exactly the case. Like half of the shows, I would have been by myself. 
mm-hmm. and half of the shows with like we're, we're, we're going to be with full production and a system engineering so um yeah but those shows are all um, canceled obviously so um, i mean it's my my uh, if you want is sitting here <laughs> um, i mean i've well like last year when i got it and when i got the m1 beater i was uh, first doing measurements here in my office with my desktop speaker um, and then we used it last summer during the the purple theater tour in the US mm-hmm. and I was uh, from a house engineer so I was mixing and but mm-hmm. the system engineer uh, Steve Sensei from Thunder Audio um, I mean I, I remember emailing him before the tour hey we've got this cool new tool and we've got the M1 beta and let's try this and, and they had P1 so that was not the problem and first he was really like hesitating a little bit because he was like oh I have my, like like same as steel or Phil was saying, you know, you have your workflow with Smart, you know your shortcuts and you know exactly step by step what you have to do. And and at first with M1, it feels a little bit different. You know, you go like, oh, why is it that order? And you know, is and why is it a sweep? And and all these questions. But I remember, I mean, with the Deep Purple tour, I mean, Steve was doing the um, tuning and and calibration. And while I was setting up uh, microphones on stage and getting everything ready on stage. He did all that and then afterwards we would have a listen and I remember this one time there was just this this smile on Steve's face and you know he showed me the traces like similar what what Steele had said before you know and he said like look the four microphones you know and it looks exactly like the prediction in sound vision and actually it's I don't need to do anything anymore I mean I mean yes we still optimize things but it was already so close um, I mean that was really and, and it was funny like that tour only like two thirds of the show we could use our own rig like we were carrying uh, 14k2 per side uh, 14 just because it was like large theaters you know with two balconies so we sure. really needed the vertical coverage but the other third we had to use in-house systems and it was everything you know and at that time you could not um, use um, m1 in a p1 group so it was a little tricky to use m1 for like a third party yeah um, already installed system. Um, but st- we, we, we try it every time and uh, yeah it, it was just really good results yeah um looking it, forward to to doing it again it in my drive right <laughs> yeah, sure. you know it's 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 like i said it's hard to explain to people why it's interesting but i think what it is is all of a sudden the workflow you choose is not dependent on the software right so um Within M1, you can EQ or capture or capture an EQ, and there's no rhyme or reason to what's right or wrong. And everyone doesn't get that until they use it for a little while and they accidentally leave an EQ or a gain stage in place and realize it doesn't matter, right? Um, And so I I use this word evolution because a lot of times I think of system calibration as an evolutionary process. You make a choice, the the, the river changes, you make a choice, the river changes. And pretty soon you found yourself down this path, but what you don't know is what the rest of the paths look like. And there's no way to see that because you'd have to go back to the beginning, try a different course, go back to the beginning, try a different course. And with M1, you can actually just turn everything off. Hold on a second. Is it better to invert the polarity of the subs? Is that going to be the better choice on all nine of these locations? And you can do that. And you can do that after you captured the data. Um, And that's a really powerful thing to also go, wait a minute, I can choose a different try and see if that's going to get to better results overall um, and and do all that so that yeah phil the first time you turn on the pa or steel the first time you turn on the pa it's like it's it's almost perfectly there um yeah. toby I, I don't know if this is true for you as a front house engineer you've got a great background in systems teching so it, it maybe your your brain can switch modes but i'll tell you what when a front house guy hears the pa for the first time and it's in really good shape it's just a you kind of take a deep breath and you go, okay, good. We can move on past that concern and we can go right on to the art side of it and get away from the just the operational, right? And versus when you turn it on and you can just tell there's a problem. It's like, oh crap. Even if it's a fixable one, it takes seconds. It's just that that brain has to stop for a moment and deal with this, right? So that's a that's a big thing um, in, in that sense. Um, I mean, for me, it's 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 just for, just because I've been on both seats. Uh, just uh, I don't know, like a recommendation to all system engineers out there. I mean, you know, we're especially on a touring situation or festival situation. A lot of times we have to rush, and when you only have those few minutes to um, to 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 get your data, and then on day one of the festival, um, it's actually the headlining act of the first night. Are the guys that actually get to use the system first? 
Um, I mean, if you're on three, uh, third day of the festival, obviously the system has already been optimized. Um, but I think as a system engineer, always take those few minutes and listen to your own tune. You know, just check very basic things, you know, left and right PA should sound the same. You know, it's, it's so, you know, and then just take those extra five minutes before you hand the system over to the front house engineer. And then you usually, if you if you feel comfortable and confident with the system yourself, then usually you get the smile back from the, yeah. from the house engineer. You know, yeah. I remember at one time I got that, the, the message, I mean, I'm not going to tell the artist, right, but I got this, oh, you did it right. I got that. I was like, okay, yeah, thank you. You know, <laughs> it, was a, it was a stadium calibration. It was quite a quite important thing, and yeah. I actually have two things to add to that. The, the this little bit here is the the first up. Uh, first off, did the system check check that you know the left signal is the left signal and right is the right? You know, it's as simple as that. You don't want to bum out your front of house guy in that in that regard of did we optimize the easy part first uh, type things. But um, back to that first corporate show I used M1 on, uh, my buddy was mixing it and, you know, we got into rehearsals and he started grabbing at the EQ in a weird way. And I was like, no, no, put that back, put that back. It's not, it's not that frequency. It's not that one thing. And I actually went backstage, jumped on M1 and actually started looking at the interaction of the five arrays in the front. And actually saw that the outer two hangs were affecting the center hang and having this boost of like 300 or something like that and i went hold on went back into the eq of m1 adjusted a couple of things by looking at you know this source to the center and actually saw that the boost was happening and you know uh fixed that little curve went back out front and he's like cool i and his graph was actually flat for the show that's how you know much interaction we had with it well, and that's that, that's interesting. So, after you took measurements, you were able to look at the way things added up in a location, right? So, and that's a really interesting thing to get your head around is, once you have the data, you can do anything with it. I can look at one array, or the sum of all five, if you captured it, right? So, so Steel, do you find yourself kind of over capturing with M1 right now because you can? Like, are you grabbing almost everything at every seat? You know, kind of a scenario. You know, no. I'll say no. Um, you know, <laughs> I want to, but I don't. Um, you know, by the time you randomize your uh, microphones, you run into the back wall pretty quick, you know, or the back of the balcony. So I think uh, 12 is about as much as I've had to capture okay. um, in one venue. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, it's 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 really interesting. Hey, I got a couple questions in from the teams live teams uh, chat, and, and there's a couple that I think are relative to this conversation. Um, someone was asking, you know, knowing what you know now, Steel, and this I think this is most directed towards you, um, in the way that loudspeakers interact with um, uh, the room and the all those kind of things. Um, do you find like like knowing more about acoustics or psychoacoustics uh, beneficial to the way you design or install? So uh, if I can maybe spin this kind of question a little bit, um, knowing what you know now about how systems are tuned and the way acoustics work, do you do you design differently now? Um, do you tune differently now than you did five years ago? Yeah, I mean, a hundred percent, absolutely. Yeah, um, you know, P PA design, I you know. You keep as much energy off of the walls as humanly possible. Um, during the tuning process, I, it's a habit I've picked up. I find myself, I carry a laser measure around so I can, I can, you know, check distance between fill and main or sub and main or microphone to the floor. So when I make it my way back to the measurement software, my mind is set to a certain parameter and I don't overshoot it or undershoot it, um, that kind of thing. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're using like obviously that experience of um, uh, 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 I think all of us have done this accidentally uh, missing the wave front by one or two cycles. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> um, never, you know, raise your hand if you've accidentally done that um, at a major yeah. festival, um, you know, um, exactly right. So, so yeah, it's a great tool, right? You take that range finder, you go, oh, it says it should be about this distance. And when when you look at the time, you go, it should be about this. You find one that works within a few milliseconds, that's probably the right one. You find another one that works that's 15 milliseconds off, it's probably the wrong one, right? Um, that's a, 
That's a really great yeah. thought. It just, it just keeps you honest, you know, so you don't so so you don't end up like you were saying down the wrong part of the stream and then you've gone too far. You know, it's just a nice check to have along the way. Yeah, totally. Um, hey, I got a question for Toby that came in. This makes sense to Toby, maybe even Phil a bit, um, but especially Toby as a mixer. Um, you know, what's your choice? Uh, someone was asking, what's your choice of tonal contour, um, especially like in arenas where the low end is so hard to deal with? Um, do you do you change the way you set the PA up in an arena or a nice theater or a festival, um, or or is it more or less the same? Um. Well, I mean, first for me, like being like for an house engineer with the purple, I definitely have a preference of uh, how much LF contour I need for that kind of content. You know, if it would be a different band, then I would probably have a different uh, desire for more LF contour or less LF contour, you know. So um, I have definitely some. Um, I mean, I, I, for example, I'm not a big fan of too many subs on the floor. You know, I really prefer flown subs, especially k one bs just for that kind of music. It's like uh, classic rock. You know, it's there's nothing really below 40 hertz. Um, so k one sb is definitely my choice rather than SB28 or KS28. Sure. And But if I would uh, be mixing a different band, then probably, depending on the content, I would probably ask for something different. Um, I mean, I find myself, I mean, probably because I am I know all about the, the, the system tech side as well. I, when I'm just showing up, let's say at a L acoustics installation, let's say at a festival or an arena or in a theater. And I usually, if, if I'm just there by myself, I usually ask the local audio guy, hey, can I see your network manager? Can, can I access things? And maybe sometimes they let me do things or I ask them to change things. And I find myself a lot of times that, um, I mean, the, the array morphing things, that's usually what I'm adjusting to my personal preference, which is not just my personal preference, but it's like what I need for the music. Mm -hmm. And that a lot of times it's, for example, for Deep Purple, I need less um, like LFC negative and zoom like 0.8 um, just to, to, to clear up that mid range a little bit. Um, but that's something I also I would also adjust during the show. You know, sure. even if I'm mixing, I would rather than doing that on my console, I would um, just do it on the on the, on the system. Uh, sure. Yeah, on the on the network manager, you know, and Usually my, my system tag, I mean, if it's somebody traveling with me, we, we know each other and we have a good relationship. And if I do something on that computer, he's not, uh, you know, because, but I've had the other case where like, um, um, people were like, I mean, it's all about communication, right? Where people were a little bit offended, more like, oh no, that's, that's my part. And yeah. in the end, it's, yeah. Yeah, we're all, so we're all I mean, effort. Come, sorry. I said it's a team effort. It, you, yeah. If you're guy, I mean, if you, if you are a team, guy, you, you, gotta, you gotta merge. I mean, that's the ideal situation. If you are a team and it's all about um, trusting. I mean, I've like Steve, who is traveling with me in the US, or there's Sven Visa, he's also a consultant for L Acoustics. He would usually travel with me in, in Europe, and we can just look at each other, you know, even in the middle of the show. And, and I mean, I trust that person also to, to walk around during the show, you know, to have a listen on the balcony underneath the balcony. But coming back to the question, um, I mean, obviously, I would just adapt to the room. You know, if I know, I mean, I, I could probably list like two or three or four arenas in Germany where I would totally say, oh, we need less subs or less lower frequency energy. And there's other venues where I would go, we might need more, sure. especially obviously outdoors, you need more. But that's a thing of experience or, you know, if you if your first time in a venue, it's always difficult to say, you know. You know, I always had that uh, attitude. It's a little easier to turn it down than uh, yeah. run out of a uh, PA. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so I mean, when in doubt, you put it all up and you go, well, we turned the subs down 5 dB. I guess we could have put up half as many and been fine. Um, but that's that's a better problem to be in than the opposite one when Toby comes in at three in the afternoon um, and says, where's all the sub? Um, and, uh, you know, has a front of house engineer uh, uh, tantrum. Sorry, Toby, I don't know if you have front of house engineer tantrums. Um, Probably. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> Phil, last question of the day, I think, and I'll bounce it to everybody. Um, 
And this yeah. maybe is going to put you on the spot a little bit. I should lie. This is not my last question. I got one more sneaky one. I'm going to sneak in. But um, what's the best piece of advice anyone's ever given you, if you if you can think of it? And if not, what's your best piece of advice you give out for calibrating thing, specifically? You know, obviously. is is after I don't know five or six years at Coachella at Main Stage, you kind of just uh, you get humble in the sense of you meet so many A list A ones you know, that come in, you're like, I looked at you, I, I saw you in a magazine and now you're sitting in front of me and you're a legend. But at the end of the day, we're all human, we're all friends at it, but the biggest part of it is just be humble, is my, my, you know, two cents to the world is be humble that, you know, you're in front of the biggest PA in the world uh, and you have the opportunity to meet these, these fine guys that can mix a show like no other, but at the end of the day, just be humble and, and, never ever ever stop learning um i know this this whole quarantine thing right now our friends and i are just working on projects you know one or two weeks at a time hey let's learn this or let's try this um and that's the thing once you get complacent you're going to get left behind so um and especially now the industry is moving a million miles a minute and it was hard to keep up and i feel like this this time we we get to keep up and and get our skills in check and learn that new thing so uh, that's my uh, my psa to the world is just be humble and never stop learning cool. uh, hey, Steel, yeah. same question to you is there a single piece of advice about system tuning or calibration you've received um that's that's you know that's been uh, really important or like cognizant to you um yeah to echo philip real quick i mean i'm al always learn there's a it, it never ends. The journey, the audio journey never ends. Uh, there's always something new to pick up. But in terms of uh, advice, the probably the best advice I got is that, you know, the measurement so uh, software is, is just a tool, you know. Um, so it's not a video game <laughs> where you can, you can win. You know, play it until where you can win. Exactly. So, uh, you know, always be if you're getting a bad measurement, go to the microphone, you know, go to the source. Is there, you know, is there a wall nearby? You know, pay attention to the physical realm you're in and the software is just a tool. That is the best advice I was ever given. That's cool. Yeah, it's really important to remember is that it's not a video game because we've all been there ourselves <laughs> or we've all seen someone do it where they win the video game and make it perfectly flat with 22 PEQs, right? And uh, <laughs> at, at one mic spot. Um, Turns out, uh, you know, I, I always feel like if you use more than three or four EQs on a PA, you probably should go back to the beginning and uh, and, and find the problem. Toby, uh, same question. Is there is anyone giving you over the years a single piece of advice? Well, I mean, there's a there's a saying in Germany that um, it will it, it relate relates to everything when, whenever you're measuring something. No matter if it's you're measuring uh, audio data or you're measuring with a tape measure, or it says in, in German it goes, they feel missed, missed, missed. It basically means if you measure a lot, you're also going to measure a lot of rubbish. <laughs> so you should always you should always question the result of your measurement. You know, I mean, obviously it takes a lot of experience and practice, um, but no matter what software you're using um, or what system you use, what approach you have, but ideally. When you start the measurement, you should already have an idea of the outcome. And if the data is a total surprise, you know, if you go like, oh, I didn't expect that at all, then probably something is wrong, like in your uh, measuring idea mm -hmm. uh, or in, in, in or maybe a really a technical problem, like the microphone might be broken or, you know, it might be maybe somebody moved the microphone. Maybe the microphone cable is one leg or yeah. the mic input is distorting. Or if you use a wireless mic, maybe there's RF interference. You know, nobody ever listens to your to the measuring mic, right? I mean, actually on, on P1, it's quite easy to do with a headphone output. But I've definitely had like one measuring mic that had a problem and then it kept bouncing around, swapping, moving yeah. around, you know, that problem. So, um, I mean, also you can obviously validate your measurement. You know, you change something, you change an EQ, you change delay time, you should see whatever you did in the next measurement, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's just maybe, uh, you know, it's, it's similar to like, it's not a video game. It's not all about, hey, I've got this cool, colorful software. It's actually um, being able to read 
the result and to use that data and even more important to realize when the measurement is rubbish i mean yeah yeah, yeah. I, I sometimes see that you know I, I show up and somebody i mean i'm just observing and then i just see the red light on the preamp and i'm like this, this i'm just watching somebody doing a measurement i'm like mm, this is never ever going to be a good measurement and yeah I mean, I mean, it could happen to me. It could happen to myself as well. I, I, I totally remember the problem with the RF mic I used one time, and and it was just dropping out, and I could not get a real good measurement. Yeah, so. yeah. The RF mic one is the one that gets me all the time because it's like, ah, it's, this measurement's so much different, and it turns out there's dropouts and distortion happening, and you're not listening to the RF mic with headphones. You go, oh, it sounds like it's dropping out, and there's distortion, and oops, um, you know, totally. I mean, That's, here, go ahead, Phil. Scott, here's one for you. You know, the the we all learned early on when we started turning on these these bits of software and it's going are you seeing what you're hearing like have you stood next to the mic and are you hearing what the mic is picking up does it sound weird it's going to look weird that's the you know is there a weird reflection or something like that always check the data coming in never just trust the screen either that's that was a you know a big one when i first started because i was very much into the screen because i'm a very much nerd on that that aspect of let's hot rod the system with this new cool, cool software, but are you hearing what you're seeing? Right. Do those two correlate together? Yeah, so. yeah. and I'm, I'm yeah. with you on that because I, I, I can I can completely, you know, gather that you see a roll off happening in the high frequency, you know, and you're like, ah, oh, I got to put a big boost in and then you put the big boost in and you listen to it and you go, it does not need a boost, right? Like, what's this roll off? It yeah. must be, there must be something else, you know? Or it turns out I don't like the sound of a big flat high end out to 16K. You know, maybe I like it to naturally roll off. Um, well, guys, I, I really want to thank you for taking the time today. My last bit to you, um, I've been asking this to some people over the years. Um, uh, we've all seen different technology in our industry come and go, everything you can imagine. Is there one piece of technology, one innovation in the industry as a whole that you think uh, has changed the way you do your job? Phil, I'm going to kick it to you first. So uh, it could be anything you think of. It could be uh, going to a Sharpie that erases. Um, that would be amazing. Um, you know, is there any is there any innovation in our industry that, that has changed the way you do your job? I 100% I can say that networking or audio over IP has changed this industry for the better. And, you know, to be able to move a single channel of audio over the internet, you know, from Arizona to New York in half of a second and do something with that and it is pretty cool. But to also, for shows like Coachella or X Games where you have 33 or you know, 34 delay hangs, how do you distribute audio to that? And that is on a network, whether it be AVB, Dante, or, you know, Five years from now, there's a new iteration of, of something. Um, I think networking for me has changed, A, my workflow, my outcomes, my quality, and all of that stuff. Um, again, from starting with a Mac Mini and a small drive rack up to now 11 mm -hmm. racks of, of stuff, networking has uh, excelled my career and our industry tenfold, I think. Yeah, I mean, completely with you on that. Like, uh, um, not having to physically route cables anywhere. Um, and the flexibility that provides that, oh, by the way, can you guys do this is no longer a call for four stage hands and a 12 core multi run, right? Um, you exactly. know, you know, it's just a matter of fiber strands now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Steel, um, same thing. Uh, you've been in this industry for a while now. Is there any single innovation that's that's changed your job, your interaction, your the way you operate? Um, I don't mean to stay on topic, but being a uh, in the fixed installation world, I would say the, the continuing development of smaller format, high performance speakers and processing has been a big deal. So something in the format of A15, because a lot of a lot of our clients have a large, you know, main worship space and they want to duplicate that sound in their smaller venues. Um, and it's 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 been really helpful to have those kind of tools and provide that level of performance um, in, in any venue, pretty much. Yeah, very cool to to realize like um, small PA's now don't have to mean a small sound, right? Um, which is yes. is something that's yes. changed over the last couple of years for sure. 
and, and that's great it to has. see. Um, Toby, last word to you. Uh, you've you've uh, you've you've carried around a wireless uh, DN360 RTA. Uh, was that the innovation that that changed your your life, or has there been a few others along the years that that changed the way you do your job? Well, well first, I can totally agree with what Phil is saying. I mean, the step from having analog snakes to all of a sudden having a network connection. I mean, that's just such a huge step for the whole industry. I mean, I remember like early 2000, you know, it was still analog snakes, like from stage to front of house, it was like analog snake, like a thick multi-core. And I remember at that time, it was the first time I was thinking, okay, how can I get a network connection from front of house to stage? And I was looking at different uh, cable suppliers and it was difficult to find like a rock robust Cat5 cable, you know, which might sound totally ridiculous now because now a lot of times it's just a fiber and network connection from front of house to stage and you're actually missing the analog line. So, I mean, that's definitely a super big change. Um, I, it reminds me on one show I did, it was the uh, Red Bull Air Race at Berlin Tempelhof Airport. I think it was 2005 and that was or 2006 maybe. It was still at the time when it was all analog. I mean, so we had like 10, 11 uh, scaffolding towers with most of them VDOS. I think 700,000 people were there. It was just speech reproduction, but the airport was still in use. So it was quite funny actually, like the uh, distance from the scaffolding tower to the first row of audience was like roughly 90 meters. So almost 300 feet, uh, yeah, right. 300 feet, because, because that was the only position where the scaffolding tower was allowed. In all snakes from one tower to the next tower, it was all, I mean, it was like kilometers. It was all analog. Um, so I was like on a little scooter <laughs> with a security guy sitting behind me <laughs> and I had the phone number of the tower so they could send me like a follow me car and I would like go to the Amprax, you know, switch on the, like unmute the crossover every morning. You know, I mean, now obviously you would do it completely different. You would have monitoring of health state of the amplifiers, you know, you could, yeah. but <laughs> that's just, but but coming back to your question, maybe the, the thing that put the biggest smile personally on, on my face, um, I think it was the first time uh, I got to mix on a K1. And uh, that was, I think it was 2009. It was a smaller downtown festival in a city in Germany. And I had just participated in the K1 training the week before. And I was kind of, one of the system tags plus babysitting front of house. And um, some of them, even some of the headlining acts didn't have a front of house engineer. So I got to mix quite a bit. And it was just like, I was just smiling like a little kid. You know, you, you, you bring up the fader and it felt like a Formula One race car. You know, it was like, <laughs> the, like hitting the it's accelerator. Oh. <laughs> and then you, you would cut like something on the, on the EQ, on the vocal, and it was like, whoa, no, that's too much. So, I mean, that was really the first time when I, I mean, I had, I had used VDOS before, but not sure. that much, not, not, not really mixing myself. Um, and I've done theater tours with ARCs and other stuff, but there was really, I was like, well, this is almost like a weapon. You know, you have to be really care. You have to get, you, you have to get used to it. You know, it, it does, it's almost like, it's not forgiving any mistakes, like musically, or even like if you do something wrong in the mixer, you know, and yeah, I mean, now I love it. But it's really, back then I was like, wow, this is fun and it's scary almost. <laughs> that's that's great. No, I, I, I know that that first feeling, um, having been a part of uh, the early days of K1. And, and I remember having to tell engineers repeatedly, um, it's going to be louder than you think it is right because it's not distorting like you're used to a pa distorting when it gets near limit a vdos guy could always tell when it was when it was getting close to the limit light you could just hear it it was just you know driver technology from the 1990s right and it would just not be as happy at that last three four five db and a k1 didn't do that and here you are mixing you're like it doesn't seem that loud until you realize you said it didn't seem that loud to the person next to you and they couldn't hear you right and and it was just you know going on and it's like then you look at your spl meter and it's like oh it's 108, crap. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize that, you know. Uh, so it's it's definitely um, uh, I, I can remember those days. It's fortunately I think with K1 and K2 we're past that, where everyone's just used to that being the new normal, right? Networked audio is the new normal, you know. Whether it, like you said, Phil, it's a Dante or AVB setup, it's the new normal that that it's an expectation 
you know, uh, uh, of those things. So I, I think that's a. Uh, that's all really great or, or you know, or steel. The new normal is PA should be full range. It seems weird that a PA doesn't go down to 40 hertz now, doesn't it? Um, you know, uh, <laughs> when when I can remember rigs that, you know, subs used to be crossed at 100 and that was pretty normal um, and yeah. not anymore. So, well, uh, Toby, thank you for taking the time. I think it is a uh, time for a beer. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank steel you. Steel, st Steel, it's probably a little early for you, so you probably have to wait a little bit before you're allowed to do that. Um, and Phil, you're going to be camping, I heard, this weekend, so you probably are going to open a beer in about two hours when you hit the campsite. Is that right? T minus three hours. Three hours, there you go. Who's, who's, who's yeah. counting time? So, yeah. all right. Well, um, everyone who's watching us live on Teams, thank you very much. If uh, you didn't already, don't forget to go to our YouTube channel and subscribe and get updates. Uh, Toby, where can people find you? uh facebook or instagram um there is uh loud and clear laboratories on facebook you can find me there excellent steel how about you you got a you got an instagram or a a, a twitter account yeah they're all my name's pretty hard to duplicate so they're all under my name there <laughs> steel Beatty. um or you can find me through uh skylark av same thing Fantastic. And if you guys haven't already seen, Skylark does some great little videos on their projects. Um, they're they're both uh, fun and enjoyable and entertaining. I think that's a good way to put it, Steel. Yes, yeah. you'll enjoy them. Yep. <laughs> Phil, uh, where can people find you? Uh, Instagram, I believe it's uh, AOIP Phil, audio over IP Phil. There you go. Um, haven't posted a lot lately, but uh, yeah, we'll get back to it soon enough. Excellent. <laughs> Well, everyone, thank you very much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day, guys, uh, and we will talk to you soon. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Bye.